Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU Journal, which offers complete coverage of communications and uh, networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this new webinar series will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today the webinar with Dr. Zijing uh, Keen from Queen Mary University of London, who will speak about semantic communications transmitting beyond bits. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. Uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A channel. We will address them to our speaker during the Q&A session. After the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something very special for you. The Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. Dr. Keen agreed to a very personal chat. She will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. Now, it's my pleasure to uh, give the floor and to introduce uh, Professor Iana Kilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the IQ Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies and founder and president of Truva from the United States. Uh, with Professor Akildiz in August 2020, we launched this new scientific journal. And uh, after a year and a half, uh, we are already proudly moving towards impact factor. Professor Akildiz established many research, research centers worldwide uh, in the last two decades. Um, He's uh, Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals, uh, highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings, is visiting distinguished professors in many universities uh, in, around the world. And uh, his current research interests include the 6G and 7G wireless communication systems, semantic communication, hologram communication, molecular communication, terahertz, uh, Internet of Things in Challenged Environments, Nano Networks, and many other topics. Uh, Professor Akilditz, the floor is yours uh, to introduce our speaker and then to moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Alessia. Again, very nice introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all around the world. Uh, we have many people uh, in the webinar, as I see. I again welcome you all to our ITU Journal for Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. I have the great pleasure to introduce you our webinar speaker, Dr. Chin Jichin uh, from uh, Queen Mary University of London. Uh, Jichin received her bachelor's degree from a prestigious university in China. It's called BUPT. Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications uh, almost a decade ago in 2012, and the PhD degree uh, from, uh, from uh, Queen Mary University in Electronic Engineering in 2016. She was a postdoc at Imperial College London from 16 to 17, then uh, a lecturer at Lancaster University in 17 and 18, it looks like she really loves United Kingdom. <laughs> so since 2018, she has been a lecturer. It's kind of like associate prof uh, in the US with the School of Electronic, Electronic Engineering and Computer Science at uh, Queen Mary University of London. And her Google Scholar is age index is 31 and total number of citations is 4,800, which is really excellent for her generation. And for her seniority, uh, don't forget she just uh, received PhD in 2016. And I followed her work with keen interest 
She did very good research on uh, NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple access. She has uh, very interesting and pioneering papers on that topic, but lately also on semantic communications. And again, I really congratulate her for all uh, pioneering work on this semantic communications topic. Now everybody is following her work. And uh, Yuchin is very active in the service to our research community. She gave, uh, again, some keynotes and tutorials at some major conferences, such as IEEE PMRC, or uh, in jargon, it's called PIMRIC, IEEE VTC, and IEEE Globcom in recent years. So it's, it's, her career is really shooting up uh, 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 extremely uh, uh, fast. And she's serving as an editor for IEEE JSAC, and IEEE transaction communications, communication letters, and transactions on cognitive communications and networking. She also served as the track chair for many conferences like Globcom 20 and 21, VTC in 2019, Globcom 2020. And her research interests include deep learning enabled semantic communication, end-to-end -end communication, deep compressive sensing, intelligent resource allocation, various applications such as UAV uh, communications and uh, famous recoverable intelligent services. Again, we thank you, Jilin, for accepting our invitation. We look forward to your uh, presentation. Thanks again. Floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akudis. Yeah, you, uh, I, I literally, before I started the talk, yeah, I want to mention a little bit things. Like when I did the PhD, I read lots of your papers, <laughs> and many, many of them, because I, you can see I worked on the compressed sensing for the spectrum sensing. So your, um, your, your nice surveys, the technical papers are cognitive radio spectrum sensing things. Yeah, that's uh, really amazing. And also you're the, the master in our era, I guess I will, and when you um, attended the talk, uh, knows you well and know thank your you. work well. Yeah, thank you very much for guiding us in the society. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to get the invitation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let me first. All right, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to introduce a little bit about our work, the initial work literally on the symmetric communications. Uh, at, uh, at the very beginning, I would talk a, a little bit about the general ideas of the semantic communication. Then we introduce our first work uh, developed uh, by my, well, my first P, uh, PhD students, literally, uh, um, Hui Qiang, who is also attending the talk uh, today. That's about the deep learning enabled communi semantic communications. Then I will um, talk uh, about the several variants based on the deep learning uh, based on this work, we call that deep SC. So the, uh, we have developed quite a few new works uh, in the area that's also mainly contributed by my PhD students and visiting students. Okay, at the, um, at the end of, of the talk, I will um, leave some open question. Actually, the research on symmetric communication is at uh, the very beginning. So I think we got a lot of problems to solve in the future. Right, so let's see the rules of the semantic communication. Now we, we all of us have seen that, okay, the research on the 6G is on the way, right? Uh, we are dealing with uh, different types of the, uh, intelligent networks, either on the uh, different, uh, different applications for the, like the machine learning in different um, perspectives of the communication system. Well, one of the key rules in the 6G or the beyond is like, as you could see from the figure, we are dealing with the different types of the uh, 
data, massive amount of the data, and also uh, the data could be multimodal. Um, so uh, one of the rule of the in the six G and beyond is. We are trying uh, not just trying to transmit the symbol correctly. We are trying to support the intelligence transmission. So for such a task, uh, symmetric communication uh, is one of the enabling techniques to achieve that. And we could uh, we could ask image that a potential application for the symmetric communi uh, communication could start from the uh, machine to machine communication as we did in the 5G. But the, what the difference is, okay, in semantic communication, we are, uh, the devices will be more intelligent to deal with the intelligent tasks. And uh, after uh, that, uh, we, we probably could be able to uh, could, uh, support the human to machine communications and, and even more human to human communications. Well, we could also see that in the industry and the research council are also quite interested in the uh, topic. Uh, I've witnessed the, uh, the uh, proposals, uh, the successful grants funded by like the, the UK, uh, UKI, the UK Research Fun Council, and also the uh, funds on the joint research uh, project between UK and the US, and mainly on the uh, statics, uh, uh, statisticians like uh, uh, Candice uh, from the uh, from uh, Stanford, uh, sorry, St uh, Stanford University, uh, who is also working on this uh, uh, on the information pursuit for the uh, multimodal data. So, also from the from the companies, we've got funds from Huawei, uh, and we also also people from Nokia, China Mobile working very actively in this uh, area. Okay, I, I noted that at the very beginning, someone asked uh, us to give a note for what is a symmetric communication. So let's have a look at the difference between the conventional uh, communication and the symmetric communication. So before, for the current system, uh, we are treating the communication system as a tube for transmit the data. We don't really care about the content of the data, right? So what we care is the successful transmission of the, of the symbols. So this is actually the first level of the communication that was categorized by Shannon and Weaver. And also we could see in the, in the past uh, eight decades, most of the researchers has made a great efforts in this area to, and we can see that in 5G or maybe in, uh, uh, for this, uh, even in 5G, we are actually approaching the channel uh, limitation. Um, well, to support those like the um, huge amount of, um, a huge amount of data provided by the huge number of devices, semantic communication actually is the second, uh, second level of the communication, which aims to support the successful transmission of uh, semantic information. So we, uh, at the uh, level two, we are actually trying to transmit symbols that to make sure they actually convey the design, the meanings from the source, right? And by doing so, when we, uh, we, we know that many of the communication, we have the corresponding tasks at the receiver to carry out, right? So with the semantic communication, all many of the researchers also call it as a goal-oriented communication. We are actually transmitting the semantic features relevant to the task only. So there are some informations that was transmitted uh, in the conventional commu uh, communication system, but not Actually, they are not highly related to a special, specific task. So in semantic communication or in the uh, goal-oriented communication, we want to transmit those features. By doing so, we could reduce the number, uh, the, the size of the data to be transmitted and uh, improve the transmission efficiency significantly. Here, I provide a simple example uh, for the semantic communication. So typically, if we want to transmit an image, 
uh, uh, in the conventional communication, we actually convert the image uh, to uh, to the uh, to bits. We process the image uh, pixel by pixel, right? And we perform then once we got the bits, we perform the source coding, channel coding, modulation, etc. And then we transmit the symbols. At the receiver, what we normally do is try to recover the image or estimate the image uh, pixel by pixel, right? So that's at the, that uh, level we are trans uh, we are focusing on the bit sequence uh, transmission. But with the symmetric communication, the transmitter and receiver should have uh, stronger or more powerful uh, for, um, should be much more stronger or powerful to deal with the, uh, to interpret or to understand the, uh, the sounds and also to understand what's the task at the receiver. With, uh, with the symmetric communication, so for example, at the transmitter, the tra uh, semantic transmitter could un okay try to understand the the content of the image that's actually describing that people is riding a bicycle, right? So at the receiver, we may not care about each of the pixel, but we care about the content. So in this case, we only need to generate a new new image based on the content we received, and which actually shares the same thematic information as a transmitter. If your task is to understand the um, uh, understand the image, of course there are. I noted that there are people using more advanced techniques to try to understand the uh, or try to describe the image, like um, sense graph generation. But that's all kind of uh, detailed uh, applied tools to support the. Uh, goal-oriented semantic communications. Right, now let's have a look at the, uh, the developments of the semantic communication. As I mentioned, the semantic communication is not a, like a, a new concept that's actually been mentioned uh, eight decades ago. But in the past, we have shown some, there's some uh, works on semantic communication but many of them are trying to follow the path of the channel that, uh, that developed for the information theory. So the researchers tried to, normally they tried to use, uh, use the logic probability and then develop the, a model to, uh, to, to provide kind of the uh, limitations for semantic communication. And typically, like the work I mentioned here, one or two, they are mainly uh, focusing on the text transmission. Because if you think about the semantic communication, then in the natural language processing, they have developed some language models that, that could help us to, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of straightforward for us to think about uh, the semantic information from the text, right? But we noted that, uh, most of the works, they are still uh, deal with the things at the world level, and also they cannot, they, they can't fully understand the meaning behind the also speech. And also the, um, the limited applications of those models also uh, narrows the, the, the further development. Here I want to, um, I want to just highlight this one of the definition for the semantic capacity. And literally that's um, provided in the work too that for a discrete memoryless channel, we could or they actually derive the semantic uh, capacity in this way. Okay, if you observe the equation carefully, we could see like, okay, the, the key difference is the third part here, right? And actually eight, eight sorry, let me... Literally, this part is used to measure the average logic information of the received message, which uh, is actually uh, in, um, representing the abil ability to interpret the received message. So, but here, unfortunately, the author uh, only provided uh, such a general expression and we, we didn't have uh, further, uh, further uh, close the format to, uh, to support or to get the semantic capacity. But I'd like to uh, highlight this. Okay, that's actually one of the, uh, one of the, the developments 
uh, in the past. Well, we could see like the limitation of the previous uh, of the existing work on semantic communication is mainly because of the lack of the general mathematical model. Like people trying to use either logic probability and some, or some other rules, but they are actually trying to follow the, uh, the way that's general defined for the information theory. But we, we note that, okay, semantic information is actually quite hard to quantify. So uh, by, to avoid requiring such a general mathematical model, we are inspired by the wide application of the deep learning. And also we noted that the deep learning actually, okay, we actually can't find a close, for, a close uh, format expression to, uh, to express the things, but we could use the like uh, deep learning or deep neural network to represent, to, uh, to, model, to model or to capture the features, right? So that's why we used the deep learning enabled semantic communication to improve the system performance. By using the deep learning uh, to design semantic communication, we are facing three challenges. The first is, okay, how could we define the meaning behind the bit sequence, right? And second is, if we could understand or we could define the uh, semantic information, how could we design the performance matrix for the semantic communication system? Because in the conventional communication system, we are using bit error rate, symbol error rate, to define uh, to measure the system. But now the transmission, uh, the focus of the communication system is not uh, the bit error rate or symbol error rate, right? We are trying to guarantee the successful transmission of semantic information. So how could we, how could we design the corresponding performance matrix to measure the system? as one of the core challenge. And the third challenge is, okay, if we could have such a system, sorry, if we could have such, uh, we could understand the semantic information and uh, know how to measure the system, how could we design it as a communication system at the semantic level, right? Okay, here I list uh, uh, a few works that I'm going to mention today. So first is uh, the DPSC, the Deep Learning Enabled Semantic Communication System. That's uh, the work. And literally we are focused for in this work, we are focusing on the text transmission and based on the uh, frame structure pro uh, proposed in this work, we further developed a few uh, ex uh, variants to support the speed transmission, the multimodal data, uh, and the multimodal data transmission. And also we developed the uh, light mode for the DPSC to make it affordable for the IoT devices. Right. Let me first introduce the, the basic structure of the DPSC. So here, as you can see from uh, showing in the figure, we have a transmitter and a receiver. The core the core cool components in the transmitter is uh, uh, semantic encoder and channel encoder. Of course, we could uh, further extend that to like later I'm discuss that we could further include the modulation or et cetera. But here we, mm, we are treating the system as an end-to-end -to -end system. So we don't separate those blocks. And uh, by at the transmitter and the receiver, we are using neural networks to represent, represent them uh, respectively. In the, here, in this system, the input is just the, the sentence. And after it passed through the semantic encoder and channel encoder, the information are actually facing two types of the channels. One is the, the physical channel that we we actually uh, we are actually facing uh, in the current uh, communication system that's uh, in the physical channel, right? And the, the other one is uh, semantic channel. So in semantic channel, we need to deal with the semantic channel noise. And here, the semantic channel noise are actually uh, referring to the misunderstanding about uh, during the interpretation of the disturbance in the estimated information. 
So the, the concept for symmetric noise would be quite wide and could be quite different for different sources. So for example, here, if we consider the text, we could consider uh, the with the symmetric noise, the sounds would be corrupted. So the sentence here, let's say that's the uh, original uh, input, that's the correct uh, of the, the, ground, uh, the, uh, the ground truth of the sen input sentence. With the symmetric channel, uh, sorry, symmetric noise, it may be corrupted like some of the some of the letters or even words in the sentence could be modified or could be changed or attacked. Uh, that could be one of the symmetric uh, noise, but of course there would be more different. Uh, there, uh, there are more uh, formats or variants. Uh, to, and also it's still not very clear how could we have a general model to uh, to represent the symmetric noise, like we did uh, for the physical channel, like we model that as a AWG, as uh, uh, a uh, AWG channel, right? Okay. Anyway, based on the basic structure, we uh, we introduced and we used the transformer based uh, uh, symmetric coding. So here, the transformer is literally a very powerful neural network proposed uh, by Google back to about for, uh, for, 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 uh, for two, five years ago. So the, tr the key idea for the trans uh, transformer is, okay, it actually uses uh, uh, attention. So let's take this picture as an example. If the sentence is, uh, the monkey ate that banana because it was too hungry, right? If we are using the transformer, the neural network will be able to uh, understand the, the correlations or the connections uh, between eight and the corresponding words. And after uh, the, by using the attention, the neural network will be able to uh, learn, okay, the, the word eight has the highest probability to, to representing the monkey, okay? If you, we use a human judge, we could say, okay, that, that's actually correct, right? And uh, it's, uh, the, probab uh, the probability for eight to represent uh, banana is relatively lower. And for the other words, that it's lower and lower. Right. So by using such a um, structure, we could use the transformer to uh, capture all the symmetric features from the text to understand the, uh, the meanings behind the text. And also, very recently, we noted that the wide application of the transformers. So uh, later, I will introduce another work uh, for based on this. Right. So for the deep essay, the detailed design is first we actually use a loss function, and the function and the loss function literally uh, includes two parts. One is uh, about the cross entropy. That's used to, uh, if we could reduce the cross, cross entropy, the neural network could learn the, uh, the meanings uh, behind the text, right? Uh, as I just um, introduced earlier. And then the other part of in the loss function is the mutual information. So here we're trying to minimize the mutual information. And uh, here the lambda is just a, a, a parameter to weight, uh, the, a weight parameter. Right, so with such a loss function, when we start to train the neural network, we will take this, we will first take the second part of the, second part of the loss function, the mutual information part. So we will try, we will try to maximize the mutual information part so that we just train, train the uh, channel, uh, channel coding and the decoding, uh, channel encoder and decoder, right? And then phase two, we will train the whole module all together. Here in the following, I will show you the performance obtained by using such a loss function and, and the training process. But what I want to highlight is the gain that we can actually get by, from the, uh, the deep SD, uh, actually from two parts. One is uh, mainly introduced by the semantic encoder and another is the uh, end-to-end wireless communication system design. So maybe you've noted as many of the researchers that worked on the 
uh, end-to-end -end communication system and compared to the typical uh, block structure uh, based communication system, we could uh, obtain a certain gain. All right, with such a design, we try to measure the system to see if that works well or if that works as we, uh, as it was expected. So first, we take the blue score as the performance matrix. Literally, blue score is uh, a typical or let's say a popular matrix used in the long, uh, natural language processing. And here, the key idea for the blue score is is trying to compare uh, compare the difference between the words in two sentences. So if you note that the the characteristic of the using the blue score. So we are still uh, compare the, the two sentences by words. But if we, you choose one group, uh, one, uh, one gram blue score, like you, you are kind of comparing the two sentences word by word, every one word, right? If, but of, also you could choose uh, two grams, three gram, or four gram. That's the popular sets in the, uh, when using the blue score. And we could see that. Okay, if for example, for the four gram, that's actually you're comparing the, the two sentences every four words, right? But we note that, okay, the such uh, matrix is still dealing with things at a word level. So here in this work, we also propose to, uh, propose to, to define the sentence similarity, which actually use uh, the BERT model. Here the BERT model is also, uh, is a, model, a uh, pre-trained model provided by Google, which was trained by a massive number of the text. And it's also based on the transformer. And we could see with such a pre-trained model, the powerful model, we can, we can map the, the sentence. Uh, actually, this model uh, find a semantic vector space. By using it, we can map the sentence from the text, the, the uh, word by word um, into the semantic vector space. And by doing so, okay, S is the uh, transmitted uh, sentence and S hat is the uh, uh, estimated sentence at the receiver. So by com rather than compare them word by word, we will calculate their distance in the semantic vector space. And if their space are close enough, we think they are sharing the same or similar uh, semantic uh, information. Right, that's the second way to measure the system. Okay, based on that, here I show some quick uh, simulation results. As you can see uh, at the left hand side, uh, we're showing, we just show the one gram blue score. And we are comparing our methods, the DPSC, with the typical uh, communication system. Like here, we adopt uh, Hoffman coding and the tube code. Um, and also we compare it with uh, uh, deep learning enabled joint source channel coding. We could see that when the SNR is 12 dB, the blue score could be improved. Like in the typical methods, it's about 0 0.1, 0 to 0 0.15. And then uh, with the deep passing, we could achieve like kind of 0 0.9. Then we can see that we could achieve quite significant performance gain, uh, especially when the SNR is relatively lower. Of course, here, I didn't show the example in a com uh, complete way. So if we further increase the SNR, the results, uh, the performance of the typical methods could be increased. But we, we, are, we are showing that, okay, actually, when the SNR is relatively uh, lower, the performance, the deep essay is quite robust, right? And similarly, we show under the same condition, we show the sentence similarity. So here you can see that when, uh, if we take the SNR as 12 dB again, the sentence, the calculated sentence similarity is actually um, almost zero, very close to zero. That is because if we are using the the typical methods, like the blue score is about 0 0.1. If we receive the sentence in, uh, with 
this kind of quality, we are actually, the people are actually un, not able to understand the meaning of the text uh, because it is full of the errors. So here you can see the sentence similarity actually is a good performance matrix uh, to, to reflect such a, such a uh, similarity uh, in, in the semantic. Okay, uh, again, when we are uh, using the DPSC, we could improve, we could achieve very good performance. That's almost to one. Okay, apart from the initial results, uh, we further apply, uh, we further adopt the transfer learning to make the DPSC adaptive to the dynamic environment. Here is a dynamic environment. Uh, I'm referring to two different dynamic, uh, two different type, types of the environment. One is about the different background knowledge. Like if you could recall the, at the very beginning for the system introduction, I mentioned that, okay, the, the background knowledge is actually the key to enable the semantic, uh, semantic encoder. And another difference is uh, another different uh, environment is about the channel condition. So we all know that in the wireless communication, the channel condition could be very dynamic and uh, varies. And by using the transfer learning here, we have shown that with the transfer learning, as shown in the black curve, uh, the performance the, the model could be uh, could be uh, could converge uh, to the state. Uh, statues and uh, stable statues. So after a few epochs, compared to the case as shown in the red, that is not using the transfer learning. But meanwhile, we didn't sacrifice any performance. Okay, that's for the DPSC. And in the following, I will introduce a few variants for the DPSC. So first is about the speech uh, transmission. Well. Here, like we are actually, I just uh, highlight the, the key challenges and our contribution and uh, mention a little bit about the performance we've got. If you are interested in the detailed work, you're highly recommended to uh, check the corresponding papers. But here, let's see, um, for the speech transmission, if, yeah, we actually adopt a similar structure as the, as the DPSC. Uh, we have the joint semantic and channel coding. Right. But for the uh, speech transmission, we actually categorize them into two different tasks. One is okay, if the transmit the transmitter want, uh, sends the uh, speech information. While at the receiver, uh, literally the receiver, either like if we are making uh, teleconference, uh, sorry, telephone call, uh, we would like to hear the voice from the uh, transmitter, right? But Sometimes we, we may only, um, maybe we are only interested in the, uh, the text, the corresponding text information from the speech. So that could be achieved by using the uh, popular, uh, many of the popular speech recognition tools, right? So here we consider two cases. And so we can uh, categorize the, the DPSC ST as a task oriented transmission. And we separate here, we separate the text the semantic information from the speech signal. What we actually did is, okay, as you, here is the, uh, the GUI that we developed for, uh, for implement the DPSC ST for the speech recognition and uh, synthesize. So at the transmitter, I use uh, the joint semantic channel coding to, uh, to get the corresponding to, to perform the speech recognition and the corresponding coding. And then I will get the text. Rather than transmitting the speech signals, I only transmit the text, uh, the related uh, semantic features from the text uh, recognized after performing the, uh, the, the speech recognition. And at the receiver, we could either recover the sentence or we could use a speech synthesis uh, model to generate the speech signal. And also we could uh, give the each user a different ID and capture some, and once they are registered, we could uh, capture the features corresponding to their voice so that at the receiver, I can easily generate the uh, speech uh, signal. That's 
highly close to the speech uh, voice transmit uh, that's at the transmitter. Okay, that's uh, that's the what we actually did. So by doing so, you can see I only need to transmit the text uh, semantic features, right? Rather than compared to transmitting the speech uh, features or the speech signals, we could lower the network traffic or reduce the size of the data to be transmitted significantly. So here, actually, this demo we. We should have put it online. Yes, I think uh, we provided a link in this uh, paper. So if you are interested to play with it, you could uh, you could uh, have a try. Right. So before I'm mainly focused on the point to point transmission. So uh, in this work, the so MUD passing, we are actually focusing on the multi uh, extended from the single user case to the multi user case. And also we are, rather than transmitting the text speech only here, we are caring about the multimodal data transmission. And also here we are trying to design a network, sorry, the semantic communication system for serving some specific tasks. So we also call it as a task or intent semantic communication system. So here we choose the vision question answering as the task. And you could say like, okay, for example, we, we just uh, take uh, the case with two users. One of the user actually transmitting the text. Actually the text is the uh, question that's related to the image that's transmitted by the other, by the second user, right? So here, each of the users, they just transmit the semantic features the, like either the text related semantic features all the image related semantic features. Well, as a re receiver, rather than recover the image and uh, text respectively, and then carry out such a task, we actually, what we actually did is we use a neural network by, by taking the semantic features from the two users as an input, and the output will be the answer related uh, to based on the question and the image, right? So if you take this as an example, this is the image transmitted by one of the user. And the question is, are there any other things that are the same shape as the small red shiny object, right? And okay, if we use uh, develop the deep SC model, the, uh, the receiver could understand, could understand the image and the text and then generates the corresponding answers. Yeah, if you de decide that, you, if you have a check that, they can provide the correct answers. But if you we use the, the typical one, the like the JPEG, uh, LDPC, um, et cetera, then they won't be able to provide the, uh, provide the correct answers due to some of the uh, impairments caused by the uh, channel. Okay, by doing so, we actually, we, here we are actually just uh, using the VQA as an uh, example to show the, to show we, uh, the multi-user case. And by doing so, we could reduce the number of the symbols to be transmitted by about 70%. And we also uh, note that the number of the symbols, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the number of the symbols to be transmitted for the image could be reduced significantly, right? Okay, that's uh, the third work. And another extension of the extension of the DPSC is called the light, light version of the DPSC, the LDPSC. And we could see that we actually, we are uh, using the IoT devices and many of them are powered by battery. So they are limited in terms of the, the power, the storage, the computing capability, right? So if we consider a system, uh, a network with massive number of uh, IoT devices. So first, the, uh, the, there's maybe a cloud or the edge that could uh, initialize or uh, train the model and for like train the deep SA model and then they can broadcast that to to allow each of them or each of the devices 
uh, to equip them with such a deep IC model, right? And then once they have the data to transmit, they can they can generate the thematic features and send it over the channel. And then the edge of the cloud could further perform the, uh, let's say the model update or the further data processing, right? So in this work, yeah, I mentioned here, um, this work, we actually used the model compression techniques to prune down uh, non-essential model parameters. So literally, we, um, after we did the simulation, we observed that if we specify 90% of the parameters, uh, the model parameters, the performance won't be degraded. We could even further decrease uh, the, the, the size of the model by 99%. Uh, but we just uh, we just need to sacrifice the performance a little bit, and then for those essential model parameters, we will need to quantize them. So typically, we use thirty-two bits in the current uh, system, right? And but uh, after the simulation, we found that we only we actually only need eight bits to quantize those essential parameters if in the LDPC without any um, performance degradation. But by doing so, we could compress such a deep IC model by 40 times. And the, the, the power consumption at the, re, uh, at the devices can also be uh, reduced significantly. OK, that's a light mode for the deep IC, for the for the affordable uh, application. Right, that's uh, the technical works I'd like to share today. So in brief, we, we develop a deep, we're using the deep learning to, uh, in, in power, to power the, uh, the design of the semantic communication. And also we develop a different terms uh, to support the text, speech, uh, multimodal data transmission. And also we consider from the single user case to multi-user case. Among all of the different, all those different design, we could see like in general that the semantic communication system show a good robustness at the low SNR region. And also it could reduce the size of the data to be transmitted significantly so that we can improve the transmission efficiency. Right. Last but not least, I'd like to share, um, share a little bit of thinking in the area. So some problems, I think that's important, but probably not solved yet. So first is, okay, as in the past eight decades, as I mentioned at the beginning, people are trying to find the, uh, like the or develop a kind of theory, let's say semantic theory. But so far we haven't got such a general, general framework for the theory, but, um, but as far as I know, there are many, uh, many series has been developed. Uh, actually, we reviewed this, those different uh, series, uh, you know, in our um, latest uh, survey paper. So if you're interested, uh, you could have a look at that. But uh, they are, they all, those series all have different limitations, like they are mainly uh, focusing on a specific area. So Probably one of the most uh, fundamental and significant challenge is uh, uh, if is there uh, such a limitation. That's also something I'd like to uh, discuss with uh, you guys. And if we could find a way to quantify the semantic uh, information, yeah. And as, well, but for 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 me or for my group, we are more focusing. Uh, we are focusing more on the application oriented uh, semantic communication. Like first, how could we construct a knowledge base to enable in the design of the semantic encoder uh, to support the different tasks and the uh, different source, uh, sources, right? And maybe oh, literally we, we need to find a trade-off between the uh, the the perform uh, the uh, the size of the data to be transmitted and the the generalization of the transceiver, right? And the third challenge I want to investigate is about the semantic aware network management. 
So before we, we normally use like the energy efficiency, spectrum efficiency, we're trying to um, maximize the, the data rates, maximize the, the, the lowers the data rate to, to guarantee the user fairness, et cetera. So we, all those object, all the optimization uh, formulation are based on the bit, right? We are processing the bit frequency in the current, uh, current system. But how could we have, for the semantic aware network, we, we need a kind of new formulation. How could we, uh, how could we reflect like, like the kind of, uh, if there is such a semantic unit, how could we can find the way to represent uh, to uh, maybe we, uh, we, we, are, we, we are thinking a way to represent or define the semantic uh, spectrum efficiency or semantic energy efficiency or et cetera. That's, that's, uh, that's more related to the semantic part in, in the system design. And also by doing so, we need to think about the resource allocation, not just the, uh, the resource in the transmission, during the transmission, but also the resources from the thematic part, like uh, we could compress, or we could um, throw many of the thematic informations, but what is a proper, uh, proper design to how much thematic information should we uh, reserve uh, for supporting the transmission and the task uh, performance uh, task executation at the receiver. So that's, uh, uh, that's a problem I think we, we'd like to investigate. Okay, here I list a few, um, like a, a few more works. As I mentioned, that's a, a survey we uh, prepared very recently and some other related works I didn't have a chance to share today. But if you are interested, feel free to have a look at them. Okay, that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Zhichin. Very nice, Thank excellent you. talk. I really enjoyed it personally. And there are many questions. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Monsieur Sar is a two. Uh, he makes some comments about uh, overall Shannon and semantic communication, but his question is, is there a theoretic limitation for semantic communication systems? Sorry, I, I didn't, sorry, let uh, me- I repeat, is there a theoretic limitation, kind mm -hmm. of like bounds, I assume, for uh -huh. semantic communication systems? That's the question. Yeah, like- It's kind okay. of like performance measure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, actually, that's a very a good and very important question. We'd like to know the, we'd like to know the, uh, if there's a limitation for the semantic communication system. But the answer to today I can give is we don't know if there's such a limitation because we we are actually still far away from uh, the way to design a semantic communication system. So, yeah, but maybe in the future, some of the, uh, the you, uh, you guys or maybe us could uh, find uh, such a way to, uh, to quantify or define the, uh, the semantic communication limits. Yeah, that's what I could uh, uh, answer at the point of yeah. today. Yeah. Uh same is that Tussar is asking, can you use visual semantic embedding to assess mm -hmm. image semantic similarity? Uh, there are papers yeah, so you know, on these uh, images and uh, like uh, evaluating them from semantic communication perspective, but please go ahead. So there are papers, is that true? Okay, go ahead. Yes, I think uh, for the semantic, uh, semantic uh, the image semantic similarity uh, for the varying semantic embedding. I'm uh, not really sure if you are talking about the same thing as like I actually I have um, students working on while well, we are trying to use a semantic embedding to uh, to find a way to construct the image. Yeah, I think. Um, 
well, the answer for this question, I think, should be should be yes to assess the uh, image similarity. If we we could find a way uh, to to quantify, uh, sorry, to we, we could find a semantic embedding space, uh, we will be able to uh, construct the image. Like we could treat them as a base, and then we can assess the image semantic similarity based on that. Okay, so I jump to another question. Uh, Sridhar yeah. Iyer, uh, he is in India. Uh, I was Sorry? impressed with him. Sri, his name is Sridhar Iyer. Oh, yes. Iyer, uh -huh. Iyer. Yeah. So he makes first a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard that before. Whether mm -hmm. semantic communication for wireless networks is just an another machine learning improved joint source and channel coding mm -hmm. kind of like auto encoder or something deeper is not particularly clear yet maybe it's for him it's not clear but anyhow so one has to figure mm -hmm. out if most gains come from improving what happens at the application layer or if the adaptation to the physical wireless channel is also important it is plausible that the most important aspect is to determine how to divide the application between transmitter and receiver. So overall, he's, you know, I think you should focus on the first part saying, uh, it's kind of like, uh, is this yet another joint source in channel coding with uh, beefed up with machine learning? Uh, you know, I don't agree, but please, uh, your opinion. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, actually, many people ask uh, about this question. Well, well, my answer for this is what we have done now is uh, deep learning enabled uh, joint symmetric channel coding, but it's not just the machine learning improved uh, source channel coding. Yeah, uh, if, okay, like as I mentioned, the one, the one of the performance, uh, part of the performance gain is from the design of the symmetric encoder. and uh, Part of the gain is from uh, from the end to end communication system design, but what uh, what we could do more in the future is well, literally I noted that some other researchers has done, but they, they that's based on the that's based on the uh, the end to end communication system. We actually need to so so far we are uh, we are actually uh, simplify the design. We we haven't just think about the uh, the the following structure we only care about the main part like the source channel coding part, but uh, if we uh, further think about we need the modulation we need to, uh, we need to design the waveform to build a system, so here we uh, if we want to have a symmetric communication we need to consider the further uh, the the following parts. What we could do like one of the simple ways okay we could add the current. Uh, Joint uh, semantic channel coding design to the uh, to the uh, to combine that with the existing uh, modulation techniques, but we could also combine that together by treating it as an end-to-end -end communication system. Um, what I've noted is that one of the work published probably several years ago, but uh, they are trying to learn the waveform uh, or let's say the the constellation diagram to support the multi-user uh, transmission based on the end-to-end -end system. So I think that's something definitely we need to further in investigate. So I don't think uh, that's one of the idea for that. It's not just about the source channel coding. And also something more interesting, to be honest, that's, that's what we could do. Like now we are using the deep learning, but the, I think the, the society, the area, I really um, uh, look forward to a, a kind of theory that uh, finds a way to, uh, to quantify semantic information. I think that's probably the, uh, one of the most important thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And there, is, there are many more uh, questions. There is one uh, uh, from Liu Chuan Hong. He's from your alma mater, BUPT. Uh, he, uh, I think it's a he, right? Uh, or she or they or whatever, right? So uh, <laughs> he, he, 
that person says it's a wonderful talk and he has two questions one is what does the different knowledge refer to in on the slide 17 i think different, different knowledge. knowledge does this refer to different training data set that's the first question oh yes i think uh here if um we if we are uh, talk uh, talk about uh, we, yeah we actually refer to the different uh, training data set but it could be a um, like a broader concepts uh like if you are changing uh changes, switching from text to some other different sources uh, the, the knowledge could be very different, right? For us to understand the image or understand the text. So that's what we, we know for a uh, different knowledge. And also I noted that some of the researchers have started to invest, find a unique way or, or a general way to model such a knowledge uh, base. Yeah. So but Lee Chuan Hong very... has another question, which is really interesting in my opinion. I, I think the best mm -hmm. question so far in my opinion. How do we start to study the measurement of semantic information and also semantic channel capacity? Wow, that's, yeah, that's a very, very good and a very important question. Uh, yeah, well, without, um, uh, without, if we can't find a way to quantify the semantic information, probably it's hard to define the the symmetric channel capacity. Like I mentioned the, the simple equation, but that's the, all they have. Like we don't have any further insights or, or results. So, so let, let's back to the initial, uh, initial question. How could we quantify the symmetric information? And I, I have noted like uh, there are many researchers tried, uh, they, they developed their own frameworks or their own work to uh, to quantify the semantic information. That could be uh, from many different areas, like even the foundry system, they try to def like kind, define kind of con confirmation of degree, but all those rules or theory, they all end up with, okay, they, they actually don't know how to, how to quantify the semantic information. So what they mentioned is, okay, they, uh, many uh, of the cases, uh, those semantic information, all the so the so-called semantic information in the system are designed manually by the experts. So you, you could see like we are uh, we we don't know like or oh, maybe many researchers from different areas they have tried to find a way to to quantify that. Yeah, but it, it's hard. We don't know if that's possible to quantify that, and also that's why we use the. Uh, deep learning to, to avoid to quantify that. Yeah, that's what uh, we can do now. But yeah, I do really hope that some genius could solve the problem. Yeah, but if you're interested, you could actually uh, have a look at the, the survey I mentioned, and also you could track the one of the, the project I mentioned in the survey. That's uh, a joint project of, um, uh, contributed by many of the statisticians, like from the Cambridge, Stanford, etc. Yeah, they, they are working on this. But uh, some of the recent work I noted from the MESA, they are also trying to use deep learning <laughs> to, to kind of solve the problems. Yeah, that's my okay, answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, one yeah. more question. Uh, Antero, mm -hmm. Ante, I call him, we call him Ante. Rainio, uh, he is from Finland, University of Helsinki. Was the amount of transmitted data measured for text transmission with deep SC in comparison to other methods? Sorry, I didn't question. quite understand. Was oh, the amount was of the... transmitted data measured or measured yes. transmitted data uh -huh. for text, you know, for kind of like, Yes. Yeah. Okay, with deep yeah. SC. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh... So you compare it with other methods? Uh, yes, I think so. And to be honest here, for, in terms of the size of the data to be transmitted for the text, we don't have much, uh, like if you check our paper for the, the multimodal data, the, the multi-user multimodal data, I think we provide the results, the comparison. Uh, we don't have much reduction in terms of the, the size, but uh, what we could do for the text is uh, we could uh, improve the robustness at a low SNR region. 
Uh, this is because, yeah, literally the size of the text is already quite small. So we actually, this is not that uh, emerging to reduce it to a smaller size. But the, for the other sources like speech or the image tag, uh, sorry, videos, we could reduce the size of the data significantly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a question, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you can see from the questions, some of them are very deep into the subject. Some of them are really trying to get into subject, I guess. And this mm. question is like, I don't know. Uh, so the question is from uh, Yang Zhao Hui. Yes. Uh, the, okay, so you know maybe uh, the person. Yes, I know Zhao Hui, yeah. Okay. Uh, does the transmitter need to send the common knowledge over I don't know what you he, or he she means traditional links he, before yeah. uh, he over traditional links before semantic transmission. Maybe yeah, I guess more. I, don't know. <laughs> I guess he's thinking like uh, if we need to share the the common knowledge or the background knowledge over the traditional communication as uh, links is that before we start the trans semantic transmission like we. I guess, like we. Maybe he, he's talking about handshaking type thing, or what? Like you know, like request to send, clear to uh, sign, and then this. I don't know. That's what maybe <laughs> he wants to say. That I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I see. Or maybe uh, let's not uh, limit it it's, to it's the like, traditional you know, links. Like yeah. you know, in the CDMA type, you know, I'm sending in this code. Yeah. Use yeah. that code to decode, right? Some I don't know that maybe. He yes, uh, I, I think uh, the the transmitter receiver. Literally, what we are currently uh, we are doing now is we do a joint. Uh, uh, sorry, the the joint training. So actually, they are sharing the those common knowledge. Yeah, we we could share it by the traditional. I don't know traditional links or some like we could design some protocols to to support that. Yeah. Okay, so one more question from Han Tian Xiao. And uh, again, I'm really uh, puzzled by the question. Uh, uh, the question is, what is the difference between semantic communication and goal-oriented communication? I have to admit, this is the first time I hear about goal-oriented communication. I don't know, maybe he wants to say data-centric communication or contents, or I don't know what goal-oriented communication means. I'm really sorry. But anyway, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like I've heard some of the researchers like to use the uh, goal-oriented communication. Yeah, I, I think semantic communication is more related to like link the level two communication. We're trying to guarantee the semantic information transmission, while the goal-oriented communication they are focusing more on the tasks. So I think this kind of more uh, kind of specific. Uh, communication system. If we have, uh, uh, if we have like relatively um, uh, specif specified tasks, we could design the system. Like uh, the the task could be just for uh, image uh, classification, right? So in this case, the the amount of the data to be transmitted could be largely uh, reduced because we. You, you, if you have enough power at the transmitter, you could even uh, do all the processing at the transmitter and the trans just transmit the classify the, the classification results. So I think the goal oriented communication is more like the, the, the level three, like you care about once you have the semantic information transmitted, how are you going to use that to carry out the following tasks or following uh, application uh like whatever is required by the application that's I mean, that's this my another, understanding is this yet another name for like i told you like the data centric communication or context uh, communication uh i don't uh, know like uh, maybe they have to work together right semantic and what he says yeah. goal oriented but somehow you have these levels as you said and then on mm -hmm. the upper layers, you go for like, you know, data centricity, like, you know, mm -hmm. does it make mm -hmm. sense? 
Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's no difference. It's kind of a complementary. But you know, I, I see more and more new names for the old, uh, you know, uh, solutions. Uh, that's the generation. What can we do? So uh, Behnam Ojagi is uh, asking about. Uh, network slicing uh, is very important, as you know, for 5G and 6G, especially automatic network slicing. And then uh, uh, he's asking, uh, uh, is it, does it need to be redefined for semantic aware resource allocation? My opinion is you already mentioned that in your last slide, right? The network management and also resource allocations, but please go ahead. So if you want to add- yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think so. Like we need to kind of redesign the way to um, to perform the resource allocation. But uh, uh, for the resource allocation, I'm not uh, just uh, talk about the resource for the transmission for the for the you know like the network slicing. We also care about the semantic related uh, resource like resources or like let's say the 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 coding rate, the semantic coding rate, etc. That's what I was I wanted to highlight in my last slides. But the, I yeah I think uh, we need to have a joint design for the 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 those resource allocations. So we need to update this correspondingly. Yeah. So That's the answer is yes. Uh, it's really important, and uh, so it will be good that some people start to look into that. Uh, so Tolga Giriji, he's from Turkey, he's asking, and I can rephrase uh, uh, it, but the exact question is how can we adapt the classical kind of like TCP IP protocol structure, right? Bits and packets and error control, routing, congestion control, et cetera, to semantic communication. So in other words, the question is, do we really need to modify the TCP IP protocol stack and consider these, you know, like we already have A, right? The, the mm -hmm. syntactic errors, like this typical classical mm -hmm. error corrections. And then we have the B section about the semantic. And the third one is the effectiveness. So if you consider all of these three cases, do we mm -hmm. really redefine a new TCP IP protocol stack? After you answer mm -hmm. it, I will add my uh, opinion. So please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've actually discussed uh, this question with some some uh, researchers on the network design. Yeah. I think uh, the semantic communication, at least the, the semantic communication I'm talking about today, we could we could make it uh, compare uh, compatible with the current. Uh, Current system, so you, you probably you just uh, replace your uh, your your uh, your physical layer, and then you could even still use uh, the higher layer as we we are using, but maybe that's not a very efficient way. It it could work, but I, I've noted that some of the researchers they've kind of pro uh, developed the a new network architecture. That's kind of. Uh, uh, the architecture they actually simplified the, or actually they redefined each of the layers, the tasks, and the, how the uh, how the data are uh, how the flow are connected with each within each layers. I actually I can't remember exactly their de design, but I I did review the a few of the the the, the frameworks. Well, they, they they are still at a very high level design, not with very specific. Uh, uh, design so so yes I think um, we could the the simple answer is yeah we could use like at least the semantic the as let's say deep SC well um, well connected to the existing network uh, structure but if we want to further improve the efficiency for the data flow processing probably we need to rectify that but that's that's another debate, like the yes. compatibility or performance. Yeah. You know, uh, I can uh, give you my opinion uh, to the question. So uh, 1990s, uh, people were attacking TCP IP protocol stack. I remember even some people were saying, we should do uh, 
instead of bottom up, top down. So the application layer should be all the way down. So all these crazy ideas were floating, but then we moved on. And now uh, I'm, I'm sure many people, especially in this uh, forum, they heard about networking 2030 and Richard Lee is pushing from Huawei for new IP. I, you know, mm -hmm. if some of you don't know, please take a look at it. And so they're, they are very active trying to redefine uh, the, you know, kind of like protocol stacks and all that. You know, my, just for, instead of like going you know, very wide, all this TCP protocol stack, uh, I think uh, it's very important to talk this question. Uh, yes, we need uh, uh, new uh, protocols, algorithms, when we look at all the ABC cases, because most of the algorithms we have from routing, congestion control, whatever you think of, they're most about you based on the classical, uh, like syntactic errors, right? Like, you know, the digital, you know, the bits, bit errors and all that. But now we have all these B and C sections. So all the algorithms may not help us to uh, satisfy those B and C conditions. So now as it looks like you and many others are really focusing on the, you know, kind of like channel and, you know, end to end with some yeah. source coding, but I, I expect uh, uh, many computer science people will jump on, they will write thousands of papers on routing, <laughs> congestion, flow control, et cetera. So it's a good question, Tolga. And also <laughs> Isatu Sar, you know, he made so many comments, I cannot read all of them, but what I distill from his comments is exactly goes with the, my statements and your answers. Uh, he is, again, I assume he's a he. Uh, uh, he says we need performance metrics, you know, yeah. a clear yeah. definitions of performance metrics, right? So I think we agree on that. So uh, hopefully uh, the uh, uh, you know, researchers will uh, look into those problems. And I think uh, the Q and A session is over. I didn't. I hope I did not miss anything. I really thank you, uh, Jichin. Excellent. I thank enjoy, you. Yeah. Enjoy talking to you. Really fantastic. You are a great thank person, you. and I have a super future in the the next decade. I can assure you that. Please continue. Thank your you so. And uh, yeah, thank I you again. It, and uh, I ask Alessia to take over and uh, continue our. Thank you very much, Ian, for moderating this session. And thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Keen, uh, for this very informative presentation. So now, uh, welcome to the Wisdom Corner, live life lessons, uh, which is based upon the idea to give a special angle to this new webinar series, um, adding a, a personal touch. Uh, so successful researcher, like uh, our speaker today, will guide students and young scholars in the field of current ICT research. And they will also share some impactful life lessons. We always say that success is not because we never fail. Success is because we never give up. So we would like to ask you, um, which is your um, hard earned life lessons or, or failure that uh, you would like to, to share with us today that might perhaps uh, help uh, someone attending this webinar? Okay, thanks very much for the question. That, that's, uh, yeah, that's, well, I'm, I don't think I'm a successful, I guess, uh, Professor Akiri so will have much uh, more experience to share how to be a successful researcher. But uh, for the failure, yeah, I did have many. <laughs> um, well, uh, well, uh, I, I think if there's the only thing that I, 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 I could share, I think it's about, yeah, if, you are really need to do a PhD. I think not just myself, maybe many of you guys, I guess many of the audience have done the PhD or is doing the PhD start. Uh, so are we really like, I think many of us have asked ourselves, oh, how can I, uh, how can I uh, make any progress for my research? How can I get a PhD? Why I'm here? Why I started? Why I chose to do uh, the PhD? But I, I think I also got this, um, 
feedbacks from some of the students. So, but I could feel like it's, it's yes, sometimes we, we, we are kind of crashed. Uh, we uh, maybe we're down. We we got the problems. We we can't solve that. We just really can't stop it. Uh, and we was uh, we start. And but I I think it's all about the 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 interest, especially like um, what I'm doing uh, now, like the the symmetric communication. That's yeah. That's actually something really interest to me. So I don't think like. Uh, I'm 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 limiting or I'm asking myself. Okay, I have to to find the limit for symmetric communication. I have to solve the problems that I I'm, don't think about. The, okay, if I need to publish good papers and like if for my PhD student Hui Chang did the first work at that time, there's not many. Uh, actually, there's very limited work related. So we start from very, the scratch. So I think uh, what motivated me is okay. That's some say really interest and uh, for me, so I so that we enjoy the research. Even though we met a lot of problems, we got rejected for the papers, uh, for the grants, for a lot of things. But uh, yeah, we know that some say we'd like to work on. Yeah, I think that's that's what I like to share. Thank you so much. Uh, I have another question. Which, which strengths um, you believe are or capabilities uh, that students or young researchers should uh, be most focused on developing? And how do you think you would suggest that they could accomplish in this? Oh, for the researchers here. Uh, you some mean the, and the, some the capabilities? Yeah. That you think they should. Yeah. Focus. If we talk about the, the the PhD at the PhD level, I think, uh, oh, oh, not just PhD. Whenever we start a new topic, I think the, the ability to perform the the proper literature review, to not just read so many papers, summarize them, really understand the the key contribution from different groups or different researchers, and what problems has been solved. What problem uh, was to to be solved, and if the are we re redevelop or reinvestigate some problem that's literally solved many times before? Yeah, I think that's uh, like find the the essential, the key problems to solve, and understand the, what the others has have done. That's very important, and without understanding that, we we can't do any further work. Yeah. Thank you. And in which yeah. field in particular and which topics would you recommend students to study today? Wow, that's quite quite hard. Maybe I'm I'm not senior enough to provide that. I don't want misleading people, but I think uh, if we want to I just limit it to start the, about if you want to be to get ready for research on semantic communication. You need a good understanding about the the at least the, the general mathematical background, the physical layer communication, and some information theory uh, things. Yeah, that's I think. Of, but it's very big and hard question. I just limited to a very narrow band. Yeah. No worries, but can you tell us uh, which is the difference uh, in the education system in China and UK where where you studied? Sorry, in what? What, what is the, uh, the difference that you see that you have experienced in the education yeah. uh, systems in uh, your country, in China, and in UK, where you studied? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> teaching. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, well, if we talk about the study, I think that, uh, like um, Professor Akudi said, I, I do really like <laughs> Brayton. <laughs> because, uh, wow, well, for the... Uh, I know that like uh, the system, like at least for the PhD education system in in China or in US, so all the students need to have some to take some modules or take some courses at the first uh, one or two years. But in Britain, uh, they they don't need to take any course; they just start work on the research topic directly. So I think that's a very different. That it's just they need to learn whatever they need when they face a problem. So. Uh, I think we will never be ready to be knowledgeable to start a PhD. We will always find that there's a lot of new problems or new new knowledge to to learn. So um, 
I think the 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 system uh, may. I, I was joking with um, many of my friends. I think oh, the Britain system really should like the diversity could be with the Britain system. The 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 outputs from the students could be quite diverse. And you know, some students they could uh, get the, the quite good uh, achievement. But then in the U.S. or also in China, I think the the average. Uh, would be uh, maybe because they got a relatively longer period to do the PhD. They got five or even six years, but in, in UK, uh, they normally do finish that within three to four years. So on average, I would say, yeah, they 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 they, they are more experienced. But I I don't uh, well, it's it's really depends. You you can't judge a student achievement uh, based on the, like a. Uh, the, the 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 length of the study etc so uh yeah but i have just at least uh, point out the difference i will just comment uh, more on the i i think both system has the the, the good points that we got uh, brilliant researchers educated by all different systems <laughs> yeah sure about yeah that. Uh, you, you mentioned achievements. I would like to ask you if you can share with us some of your, the most uh, tangible contributions that uh, you have made, uh, you believe you have made in your career that had a direct impact on your uh, professional life or your personal life as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, I do feel that uh, education, not just for PhD, like for the undergrad student, that's really I mean, I, I never, I never feel that that's that, uh, proud after I received the, the message from my student. Okay, I've got this uh, super nice offer. Thank you very much for the support. Yeah, we never think about that. So, okay, and why was the students? I, I can't feel that. I, I can't understand the, how much that mean for a teacher or for for uh, for for a lecture. Uh, so I, I think the most. Uh, I, I feel very proud of the, I, I saw the, uh, the, my students, they, they start from the beginning and they grow up, they generate good results, like many of them shared that today. So I'm really proud of the, the, the yeah. And I'm proud of myself to get this, uh, to educate and work together with the students. Yeah, and I saw they grow up. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very yeah. much. I have a, a last uh, last question uh, for you. If you want to share with us before we close this webinar, like a motto yeah. that uh, you believe in, an aphorism or a book, uh, a movie, uh, music uh, that you want to, mm -hmm. let's say, describes you uh, or your professional path that you would like to share with us. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I think the movie, the, the quite famous movie called uh, The Forest Gump, maybe everyone knows that. Yeah, I, I, I watched that. I, I can't remember how many times, but uh, that's really inspired me. And uh, uh, yeah, you, if you haven't watched that before, I really encourage you to, to check it. Uh, I think like people we have up down in the life. I mean, during the study, I'm still <laughs> young. Maybe I, I can't talk much about the life experience. But uh, during the study, the research, we, yeah, we met good people. We met. We got a good topic. We are at a good timing to start uh, the uh, new research. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, we got uh, rejected. Uh, yeah, I mean your ideas, uh, your papers, etc. But yeah, ne ne never, never give up. You never know what life will bring you tomorrow. It's like a box of the chocolate, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I like from the movie. Thank you. That's nice. Uh, Ian, uh, yeah, you want to intervene, uh, please. Uh. <laughs> Again, thanks a lot, really. Fantastic. Uh, I personally enjoyed it, and I assume everybody else enjoyed it. Uh, I thank you. I actually, on behalf of the entire ITU team, we thank you for taking time and presenting us your excellent research results. And hopefully we'll be in touch, uh, Jichin, and hope to see yes. you somewhere, right? Yes. 
Yes, sure. Yeah. Thank you. thank you very much for the invitation and thanks nice everyone. Well, thank you very yeah. much for joining thank us today. You. And Ian, I would like to remind our um, attendees that our next and final um, webinar for this first series will be held on the 22nd of June at the same time. And it will be uh, Professor Joseph Jornet uh, from Northeastern University who will talk about ultra broadband communication and networking solutions. Uh, to unleash the terahertz band. Uh, and so I hope to see you again online with us. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dijin, for, for your contribution. We really enjoyed thank this you. talk. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Lot, yeah. thank thank you. you. Bye. Yeah, Bye. thanks. Yeah. Bye. And Bye. I also thank the uh, participants for taking time and uh, listening to our speaker today. I hope uh, you benefited from this webinar. And we have the last speaker, as Alessia mentioned, in three weeks. However, I have good news. Uh, our series will continue in the fall. We have outstanding six more speakers. They are really outstanding, like this uh, phase. And hopefully, uh, you will join us also in the fall. Thank you, and enjoy your day and night or evening, whatever, <laughs> wherever you are. Yeah. So thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. Much. Bye. Bye. Bye.